which is essentially the problem of the origin of the information you need to build the living system, is, provides one of the strongest arguments for design. And you told me the same when we were backstage, that the, there was a, a strong place for a creator. It's at the, at the point of the origin of the first life. Uh, I think you misquoted me on that little deal. Bruce Ballack is here, one of the great astronomers at the University of Washington. He, he told me that we could give you all the telescopes in the world if you could give us some new proofs, new ideas, new ways to test how solar systems form. My sense of the origin of life, it turns out the coolest new thing we found, it may really be related to meteor impact. And I, there's a group at Caltech who is now studying impact craters as a way to make chemistry sets. I mean, we, it's really clear you need a chemistry set to make life. You need a good test tube. An impact crater is just that kind of test tube, especially if you link them together on a slope. You can weigh of distillating material. You can get it wet, evaporate it, wet, evaporate it, wet, evaporate it. And then Steve Benner, I talked about, has figured out that borax soap Anybody old enough remember that Ronald Reagan was 20 mule teams borax? The old ranger himself. Well, who knew that borax soap may be the way that life started on Earth? Borax soap, when you wet it and dry it, turns into ribose sugar. You just start adding a little chemicals and you get RNA. I mean, there's origin of life right there. I, that's what you call overlooking the, the Ronald the, the, Reagan yeah. theory of the origin of life. Uh, there's a big thing in origin of life called the sequencing problem. And arranging the, the parts of the molecules that function as alphabetic characters is, is the big problem. And the, 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 I, I think it is interesting, whether we're talking about genet genetic algorithms or the kind of uh, 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 ribozyme simulations that are being done, invariably to move life in a more information-rich direction, to move these molecules in a more information-rich direction, it requires input from the investigator. And I think no these, are, these are no these are simulated. Way. The, no, 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 I, no, I, no, 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 no. I'll yeah. send you the papers. I mean, you're, 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 you were maybe incorrect two years ago. Harvard University just put $100 million into a center for the origin of life because they know this is about one of the hottest scientific areas in the world. And we will have artificial life, I predict, in a decade. Who's we will designing start, it, Peter? We will have no, no, no. It's no, it's the science. It's the scientists in the laboratory. It's the, no, 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 no. I, let, me, let me respond to that. We are going to recreate exactly what the early Earth was like. You know, that's designing it. You've already said that science is about recreating and experimentation. If we put the same set of chemicals together and have the same conditions, because we can't have those conditions anymore. There's oxygen and all this stuff, and shake it up in a reasonable way. This seems to be the same way that life started on this planet. Isn't this a proof that it can happen without a creator? No, it's not. It's not. It is. You're I missing. Mean, you've you're done a scientific experiment. The, you've used science to you're, create you're, life. You're, you're missing the crucial element here, which is the role. The role of the investigator in over the R, the no, RNA world no. requirement, even to get simple self-replication, you need to have a molecule which is a template mm -hmm. and also. A, a polymerase. And Cindy okay, Check won the Nobel Prize for showing no, that RNA can do just that. He can, you can do uh, it if you can sequence the, the, the bases in a precise way so that they have function. But who's doing the sequencing? See, what the you investigator. Have not, what you have not let us have is we're also going to give you millions of years. <laughs> and that's a quite a different let's, situation. Let's go to another question. Could either of you publicly acknowledge the weakness of your respective beliefs, philosophical or scientific? Why don't we just say no and move on? Yeah, oh, let's move on. The weakness of our beliefs? Uh, my belief is that the Mariners are just going to go to a 90 loss season. But let me ask you, I mean... Get serious? I, I'm not being paid anything. Oh, okay, we'll see. Okay, they don't want to answer that. Um, this is a question for uh, Steve. Why do you keep saying that Darwinism is undirected? Random mutation is undirected. Natural selection is direction. It's not directed by an intelligence. That's, that's not an applause line. That's a technical question. No, it's undirected in the sense that there is no mind involved in it. And that's been part of the, the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Uh, uh, I mean, every major evolutionist would accept that. Um, I mean, I'm not, we're, not, we're not saying that, that, that neo-Darwinism is committed to chance. I mean, creationists will sometimes make that uh, misrepresentation theory. We understand that it's natural selection acting on random variation, but natural selection is not a, a, a directed or intelligent process. It's an undirected process that some have argued mimics the powers of a designing intelligence. 
Here's a designing an intelligent question. Is there a bar big enough for all of us to go after this? <laughs> Peter, I, I, I think your mind I'll is wandering. I'll design a drink if you all have one. We, we, still, we still have more questions. Uh, Peter, here's a question for you. What is the, the strongest empirical evidence to date that clearly demonstrates vertical evolution has occurred? That is, one species evolving into a different, more advanced species. What's the strongest piece? Well, there's so many lines of those evidence, but let me go back to my own, is that I began this career of mine as a, a lowly ammonite paleontologist. I actually brought those two. And if, the beautiful thing, if you go to the rock record, is in sequences of rocks, you can watch fossils change. And in ammonites that I've studied, I've watched uh, very thick sequences of rock have the same kind of fossil, same kind of fossil, and then you have thinner sequences with transitional forms, and then thick sequences with the same fossil, the same fossil, the same fossil. So you can watch con continuation, then you can watch nice evolutionary change, and then you can see a second daughter species. Sometimes the first species keeps going sideways. This is punctuated equilibrium. And you can see complexity increase. In my creatures, I walked into this thinking, well, I've heard so much about no missing links, right? You hear about it in grade school. It's not true at all. Fossil record is filled with these things. I, I, I agree with Peter as far as the, the lower taxonomic levels. I think at the uh, le lo level of species, that's absolutely true. When you get to, uh, there, there are large punctuations at higher levels that I don't think a, are, are docu the trend where the tra transitions are not documented. You have the mammalian radiation, you have the Cambrian explosion. Uh, these kinds of events, I think, suggest that at the higher taxonomic levels, that the discontinuity that we see in the fossil record may well be real. Though, as I said, that's a, a, a question where uh, that, that's not essential to Boy, we just found a nice design. amphibian, didn't we? Isn't that great? Uh, well, the, you, still, <laughs> you, still have, you still have no, no real transition to the, uh, the actual uh, the pod. It's supposedly a transition to test. Is Chris Cedor here? You still got it. You guys got Chris. Yeah. What do you think about that? No transition? <laughs> you going to go along with that? No, you're not, not going to go for that, right? Uh, that was Peter's question. Steve, a question for you. Uh, is it true that the Center for Science and Culture was responsible for sec successfully lobbying to include a provision in No Child Left Behind Act that would require states to include teaching the controversy of evolution in public schools? Uh, uh, Philip Johnson, the professor from Berkeley, uh, was uh, tapped to help draft that legislation. Uh, he's an advisor of our program and a prominent person in the ID movement, but not a, a fellow of, of the center. So. That, that, okay, that's, that, my follow-up's not on the card. My question, though, is that, then, you know, you guys, it's not just science. It's not right? it is, ID it is, movements. It is a movement sounds political to me. Movement. ID Sorry. movement. Hmm. The cat is out of the bag. Hold on one sec, Peter. <laughs> that, that, that's the question. Well, I mean, here, here's a, I mean, I, see, it just seems to me that that's where we get it. It's not just science. Yeah, of course there's discovery. a political context to this discussion. I mean, that's the, the, the You have to try to promote the, this. The, the, the politics is derivative of the fact that there are real scientific disagreements and that we think that students should be permitted to know about those disagreements. question for both of you. How does the new knowledge of quantum physics help to bridge the gap within your conversation? Peter, does it? <laughs> All right, you stumped him again. Bruce. Bruce Ballack helped. Yeah. We have a I Bruce that works on that. Is there a quantitative or mathematical means of expressing irreducible complexity? And if so, what's it based on? And if not, why not? Uh, there, the concept is originally advanced by Behe was qualitative, the idea that, that irreducible complexity could be defined as a system of many well-matched parts that perform a function such that the removal of any one of them will cause the, the function of, of, the, of the system as a whole to lose, um, to, to be lost. Uh, there are quantitative uh, innovations in our understanding there, there, there is some more quantitative analysis that's coming online that will refine that definition further. Uh, there's a scientist at the University of New Mexico named David Keller who has noticed that not only do the many parts, for example, in the, in the flagellar motor have to be present to get motility, but that the individual parts have to be built within very precise tolerances that enable you to begin to develop, and th this observation begins to enable you to develop a quantitative understanding of the degree of complexity that may be involved in, a, in an irreducibly complex system. 